I'd like to invite uh, a very good friend and a scholar to give some opening remarks on a key issue that our panelists will also uh, discuss, and that's the issue of institutional racism and police brutality. It is a major issue in our society today. Racism here or racism abroad results in the same thing. The dehumanization of people and the violation of human dignity so that when they die or when they are brutalized, it's as if we're just getting rid of flies. And that result of how we deal with racism is so gut-wrenching, but so important for us to address and to deal with the racism within our own community as well as we figure out how to engage on that issue socially. So I'd like to invite Dr. Mohamed Fadl. He's a law professor from the University of Toronto and, a, and one of our scholars in the community to deal with the issue uh, of, of racism, police brutality, and how do we engage on that issue. Dr. Fadl. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Jihad, for that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with this great community in Southern California. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The year 2014 marked the return of racialized pol policing to the top of public discourse as a result of two widely covered instances of killings of African American men at the hands of local police, along with the subsequent failures of local grand juries to indict either police officer on criminal charges. The first case involving the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, led to sustained anti-police protests that, in some cases, produced additional violence, arrests, and destruction of property. The second case, the killing of Eric Garner in Staten Island, while the police tried to subdue him on the minor charge of selling contraband cigarettes, did not immediately lead to the same kind of civil disturbances in New York as, w as we witnessed in Ferguson, but immediately raised questions in the press regarding the persistence of the use of tactics, in this case, a chokehold, that in theory had already been prohibited 20 years earlier. Despite the prescription of this, this tactic 20 years ago, the New York Times reported in the wake of Garner's death, that the Civilian Complaint Review Board in New York had logged 233 allegations of the use of this unlawful tactic in 2013 alone. The ubiquity of video images in the age of the smartphone and YouTube, moreover, has made what in previous times might have gone unnoticed as local incidents national cause celebs, forcing citizens to take stands with respect to these two events. Predictably, the killings, the subsequent reporting and video documentation, instead of leading to a convergent narrative, reproduce the dep all too depressingly common racialized split to which we have become inured in the US. According to a report published by the Pew Research Center in the immediate wake of the Brown killing, 80% of black respondents indicated that his death was indicative of the wider need to confront lingering problems of race in the United States while only 40% of whites expressed the same opinion. The subsequent failures of grand juries impaneled in both Ferguson and Staten Island to indict either of these officers on any criminal charges has only served to reinforce these pre-existing racial divisions and perceptions. In these introductory remarks, the allotted time is far too short for me to go into a detailed history of policing and racism in the United States, and even during the colonial period that preceded the United States, where much of this originated. But if I am allowed to simplify slightly, it is beyond dispute that at the heart of the American project, even if we dismiss it as the Mr. Hyde to liberal America's Dr. Jekyll, was a system of racial subordination that at every turn asserted and enforced the inferiority of blacks. And it's very hard to underestimate this. Racism permeated every single aspect of American social life until very recently. No sector of American life was free of racial prejudice and racial subordination. 
This was not simply a system of cultural prejudice, but something that was incorporated into the law and enforced coercively by courts and police. The federal government, through its own policies, helped maintain and reinforce racially segregated neighborhoods. We think of apartheid as a phenomenon in South Africa, but there was a de jure system of apartheid in the United States until 1964. Woodrow Wilson, often hailed as the anti-imperialist champion of the right to peoples to self-determination and a progressive president, which he was in many ways, but he was also a racist. He instituted de jure segregation in the, in the executive branch of the federal government for the first time in the United States history. So he established departments in the federal service, federal service, service federal ser, civil service, excuse me, just for blacks and other departments just for whites, ostensibly to protect blacks from racial hostility. But that, wasn't, that was the kind of protection that blacks at the time did not want. Right. President Wilson also resisted the insertion of a clause on racial equality in the Treaty of Versailles, which concluded World War I. In short, unfortunately, racism is as American as apple pie. And only if we are willing to admit this fact will we be able to confront it and hopefully overcome it. Overcoming the past legacy of racism and its enduring uh, realities is a, is a moral challenge of the first order and one that should unite all Americans. But what is our particular role as Muslim Americans in confronting this legacy? Well, I would say the first obligation that we have to ourselves and, to, and as Muslims is to educate ourselves on the reality of the history of race in the United States. This will require us to venture beyond the orthodox triumphalist narratives of US, history, of US history that we are taught in schools or that we study in preparation for citizenship exams for those of us who immigrated to this country. We have to embrace critical histories of the United States, not because we embrace criticism for the sake of criticism, but because we have to know, we have to have a realistic picture of the history of our country. Too often, particularly those of us who are immigrants, have come here after many of the fruits of the anti-racist struggle were already achieved, and we've become the beneficiaries of this struggle without having had to sacrifice to obtain it. And we take it for granted, norms of non-discrimination, that blacks certainly never have and can't today. And so for, the, for us, many of us, it's hard for us to understand um, African-American complaints about racism because we come here and we think of the United States solely from the perspective of post-1965. Right? We don't look at the grand sweep of American history and how that in many ways continues to dominate post-1965 in the United States. This, it seems to me, is required if we are to fulfill the Quranic imperative of witnessing a task which God has unequivocally imposed on us. The Quran states, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا and in this way, God has appointed you a middle nation so that you may be witnesses over the people and the messenger of God be a witness over you. The Quran's praise of the Muslim community as a middle nation has sometimes been misinterpreted to mean something approximating a geometric midpoint between two extremes, for example, on a line. Now that would lead to the absurd conclusion that if you're living in an extremely racist or extremely unjust society, then the moderation would be to be moderately unjust or moderately racist. That's not what the Quran is talking about when it says that Muslims are a middle nation. What the Quran means when it says that Muslims are a middle nation is that we are impartial and fair. The kind of virtues that allow a witness to be credible. You don't accept the te testimony of a witness if the witness is biased 
Only if the witness is impartial and fair do you take what he says seriously. Right? So being moderate is not being in the middle of two incorrect positions. It's looking objectively and seeing what the truth is and, and stating what that is, regardless of that, whether that makes you a majority or minority loved or hated. In the context of the police's use of excessive force, objectivity requires us to recognize that there are often two conflicting rights. The right of citizen, the citizen to life, or the person to life and liberty, and the right, indeed, the obligation of the police officer to enforce the law. We need a principled way to resolve this conflict, not an approach that reflexively blames, for example, either the police or the citizen. If we did, we would be biased. We wouldn't be fulfilling our moral obligation. But the problem in the United States, as, as I perceive it, right, uh, is that there are two main problems that results in police in, 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 leth in use of lethal, lethal, lethal force and unjustified killings. The first is that our law simply gives too much deference to the decisions of the police. This is something that affects everybody, white, black, brown, man, woman. Our law gives too much deference to the decisions of the police, and as a result, one would predict that police, when in doubt, will use force. Even when subsequent events show that they were mistaken that the victim really didn't pose a threat. But our law gives them the kind of incentives to err on the side of themselves, okay? So that's a general problem. The second, and this is the racist problem, the problem of racism, is that black citizens bear the social cost of lethal force. Whether we want to attribute it to intentional racism on the part of police or simply structural racism, the fact is that blacks suffer uh, death at the hands of the police at a rate three times greater than whites. Like that's a shocking difference. Three times greater than whites. With this racial disparity in the victims of policing, it is not surprising that the citizenry is racially divided on the question of the extent to which race is a problem uh, in, the police, in, in, in policing. But I think, again, when you look objectively at the facts, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that there is some serious structural problem without having to make an accusation that individual police officers are themselves racist. That may be the case, but the biggest problem, and I suspect that the deeper problem, is that structurally the system operates in such a way that minorities and the poor are much more likely to be victims of force than uh, the well-to-do. It is our responsibility as Muslims to stand fast for this truth and work constructively for all, with citizens of all good faith in an honest and sincere attempt to solve this problem. I'm sure today's speakers on the, on the various topics that they will be addressing throughout the day will all discuss these issues and other issues of common concern from what to me is an essentially Islamic perspective. Thank you.